My name is David Gladney. I am one of the Orchard Initiative pastoral residents here at Exodus Church. If you would, go ahead and turn to your Bible to Isaiah, and we're going to be in Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7 this morning. Before we dive into our text, I've got three things I want to share. Uh, the, in that video was Ryan and Diana Clater. Ryan and Diana, they are members of our church. Uh, they are also mentors of myself and my wife, Emily, as part of my residency. So sweet that I get to be here and talk about them this morning. Uh, so all of our donations and offerings that are giving to the international offering are given to our international partners. 100% of what is given goes directly to these partners so they can do the work of ministry and missions in their area. They serve their church, they share the gospel, and that is what your money and what your offering will give. So over the next couple of weeks, you'll continue to hear from a couple more of our partners. And over the next couple of weeks, con consider and pray how the Lord would give, have for you to give to our partners. And just over this Christmas season and for the rest of the year, continue to pray for our international partners. If you'd like to give, you can give in a few ways. First way is through the Church Center app. On, so if you have your phone, you can give through the Church Center app. You can give that way. Or after service, if you want to give, go to our info desk. If, and you can, there, you can learn more about how to give and how to give directly to our international partners. And then finally, you can go to the Connect Corner where we have our gift box. And then you can give through one of those envelopes there and write international offering. So this Christmas season, uh, pray and consider how much God would lead you to give. If you are a guest this morning, we are so glad that you are here. If you're a first-time guest, we would like for you to go to the info desk in the commons, and you, we have a gift for you there. And that gift is a gift for you to welcome you and for you to help learn more about Exodus Church. I'm going to point you to three cards that are in the seat backs in front of you. The first one is the black welcome card. That is a card that you fill out inf your information and how you would like to get connected here at Exodus. And if you turn that in into one of our give boxes, somebody this week will contact you in a respectful way to help you get connected. We want everyone who calls Exodus to find their place to belong and to part to play. And so those are the two cards I'm going to show you next. The first is the red community group card. Community groups is where we get into smaller groups and we fellowship with other believers by uh, just eating and, and discussion over scripture. So if you would like to be a part of a community group, fill out that red card and turn it in. And all, we also believe that everyone has God-given gifts to serve himself and to serve the church. So if you, would, sir, if you want to serve Exodus, fill out that blue card and turn that in and someone will connect you this week. I have one more exciting thing to celebrate before we get into our uh, text. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who participated in Angel Tree this year. This year we partnered with six different organizations and we were able to fill 225 tags, which was 110 more tags than we had last year. And we were able to fill tags from babies all the way to senior adults. And so I want to thank all of you who, who were able to get tags and to provide for our families. Or you came to one of our serve nights, whether it was the wrapping party or to the gift pickup day yesterday. I want to thank you, uh, and if, if, if with you, that we were able to do that. I want to say a special thanks to a few people. Uh, Cassie Guku, Brittany Galloway, Abby Purdue. Amber Diffley, Kenneth Gray, my community group who helped organize, and then Exodus students who served in a variety of ways. It was with their leadership and your participation that we were able to fill these 225 tags. So thank you all who participated in Angel Tree. Again, we're so glad that you're all here. And now that we're thinking about gifts, I want you to think about the greatest gift that you ever got at Christmas. Maybe it was a bike, or maybe it was an Xbox, which it was in my, in my case. And you wanted this gift so bad. Think about a Christmas story when Ralphie, he wanted a Red Ryder BB gun. And he annoyed his parents, he annoyed his friends, he annoyed the viewer. He wanted this Red Ryder BB gun so bad. And you, probably when you wanted your gift, you annoyed your parents and friends and viewers as well. And so for me, like I said, it was this Xbox 360. Now think about when you came down the steps into your living room or wherever you got your gifts, how you felt when that gift was there. It was sitting there, all my bickering and all my annoying worked, it paid off. What was your reaction? Was it, I'm sure it was, maybe you cried, maybe you laughed, you were filled with joy. You were overwhelmed with this sense of happiness. 
But I would guess that that gift is long gone, or if you still have it, I'm sure it's not in the same condition as when you got it. Today, we're going to talk about a gift that is so much better than any gift than we could ever receive. We're going to talk about a gift that will never decrease in value, that will never collect dust. This gift will always be, and it will always stay the same. This gift is Jesus. And today, we're going to see how Jesus, our gift, is our light when we are in darkness, he is our victor when we are defeated, and he is our king who is going to welcome, welcome us into his kingdom. So our main idea today is that Jesus is our light, he's our victor, and our king whose kingdom will reign forever. So this is our second week in the God Who Came Near series, and we're in Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 7. So let's read that. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can gather here as believers to, to fellowship with one another, to worship you in song and in scripture and in serving. So, Lord, thank you for this morning that we can do that. And thank you for this text that you have given us today, Lord. Thank you for this gift that you have given us that we are going to see that is our light, our victor, and our king, God. So, God, I pray that you will speak to us this morning. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, again, our main idea is that Jesus is our light, our victor, and our king, whose kingdom will reign forever. And from that, we'll have three points. The first will be our light, the second, our king, and the third, uh, sorry, second, our victor, and the third, our king. Let's start with point one, our light. Reading in verse one again. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. So our passage today begins with a conjunction, the conjunction, but. So this but connects what is happening at the end of Isaiah and what's beginning at the beginning of Isaiah 9, which is where we are today. So let's quickly look back into Isaiah 8. We're not going to read it, but we're going to look at Isaiah 8 and to see what is going on and what Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 9. So the people of Israel in Isaiah 8 decided to reject God, so, but not all of them did. So there are two groups of people, those who are on the path of light and those who are on the path of darkness. Those who are on the path of light are people who know God, they know his character, they know his words, and they know to trust him and that, that he will provide. Now, this people, as a small group of people, the majority of the people are these people on a path of darkness. These were people who sought wisdom from other places, from God. They, they sought their own wisdom, and so they were left spiritually famished, and they were left rejecting God. This is the majority of the people. The majority of the people in Isaiah 8 rejected God, and they began panicking as their days started to be gloomy. Their days started to be really dark. These people, instead of following God, were being influenced by an evil king named Ahaz. So they rejected God to follow Ahaz because they trusted Ahaz with provision before God's provision. And because of this, they were left in darkness. It was because of their sin they were left in darkness. And for us, when we reject God's provision and we follow evil influences, we are left in darkness as well. When we reject God, it's because we think we know better than God. 
and we follow someone or someone that is someone or something that isn't God, and we're being led down this dark path of evil influences. And we believe that there's an evil influence who has an evil ideology that is better God, better than God. An evil ideology is anything or anyone that leads us away from God. And we follow these evil ideologies because we don't know God. We don't know God's character, and we don't trust his provision. And so that leaves us in a spiritually dark and a spiritually famished place. But God, he's always good. His provision is always good, which means his, he, his promises are always good. So God, who is rich in mercy and rich in grace, didn't leave the people in darkness. The people who walked themselves in the darkness, he didn't leave them there. So let's book, but look back into Isaiah 9. Verse 1 again, there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. This is the people of Israel. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So the people, they were living in a dark place. This, these lands that are mentioned here in, in Isaiah 9-1 throughout Scripture are described as being dark. They're historically dark in scripture but it is in these lands that hope and that light will come in matthew 4 jesus begins his ministry in these same dark lands so in lands that are historically dark jesus enters so the dark became light and let's look into verse 2 to see how the people reacted the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone Again, these people were living in darkness. They were living without hurt, but it was God who turned their darkness, their hostility, their hopelessness, their helplessness into light. God and his great provided light into their darkness. The people didn't try hard enough. They didn't give enough money. They weren't good enough to bring themselves into the light. Verse 2 said, the people walked themselves into the light, and it was God who shined the light onto them. They earned their way to be in darkness. It was God's grace who brought them into the light. It was God who showed them the light, and it was God who brought the Savior, and the Savior is Jesus. And throughout Scripture, we see God being described as the light. Jesus says in the book of John, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We all once were living in darkness. There was this time when I was in high school, my dad and I, we would go hunting uh, every fall, and we would have woods that we leased, and we would go hunting. This one particular afternoon, it was late, we, my, my dad and I, we invited my brother-in-law to go with us, and we all set up in different parts of the woods. And the night, the eve afternoon is getting later and later, it's getting darker and darker, and we're not seeing anything. But then my brother-in-law, he texts and says, hey, I, I think I see something coming in. Let's wait a second. And so my brother-in-law, he eventually, he, he gets it. He gets what he, the shot. And now my dad and I, we come down all, out of our trees. We pack up our stuff and go to my brother-in-law and where the deer is. And we, have to, we get there. We clean up the deer. We get my brother-in-law. We pack up his stuff. And we all look up. And it's real dark. And if you've ever been in the woods late at night, it, a woods dark is really dark. And it's, it's, it's pretty scary that we had a lot of fear. And we had like the oldest iPhone at the time, so we didn't have really good light. We didn't have sufficient flashlights, and we had no compass. And we didn't have enough sense to download a compass app on our phone. And so we could not get out of the woods. And so we are walking into these woods aimless and lost. And it, we, we were filled with anxiety, fear. We were bickering with one another. We are just trying to get to the car. And so eventually, we find our way to the, to the end of the woods, and we still find a dead end. So we'd find another way. Eventually, we would click our key, and there's our car. There's, there's our truck light. The, we, we know we're safe. So we're in this dark area. We click the truck, and we know we are safe. We all, us, were all in darkness. We all were once lost and aimless, with full of fear and bickering with one another. But it was God who brought the light. 
we all decided to follow our own path like the Israelites in Isaiah 8. We rebelled. We sought wisdom from evil influences. We were less spiritually famished. Our sin did that, but it was God who brought us into the light. He did not leave us into the darkness. God came near to us. He sent his son Jesus so that we could be saved. Where we walked into darkness, he brought the light. And God showed us this light so that we could be saved. Jesus is our light. And we're also going to see how Jesus is our victor, which leads us to our second point, which Jesus is our victor. Let's read verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Now, I just shared a time where I was in darkness. Reflect on a time you were in darkness. Maybe you were in the woods. Maybe you were in a dark parking lot. You could not remember where you found your car. Or it's in a dark room, and you don't know where the light switch is. Now, maybe you feel anxiety, or maybe you have a lot of fear. But imagine when you find that light switch, or you find the truck, or you you finally find the car in the parking lot. Your fear turns to joy, or at least relief. Studies show that people are more satisfied in life when there's more light. It's daylight saving times right now, and it gets dark at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> compared to the summer when it, it gets light. It, it stays out. Light stays out till like 9 o'clock in the evening. People are more satisfied in the summer because the light stays out later. Light brings joy, and light brings satisfaction, and that is what is happening in this passage. The Israelites, they're responding to light, and they're overcome and overwhelmed with joy because they were living in darkness. And then joy came into their life. And they're celebrating because their nation is growing. And it says that they're rejoicing like the day of harvest as if they had just won the war. Imagine uh, New York City after World War II and all the people in the street celebrating. That is what is happening for the people of Israel. They were defeated. They were living in darkness. But now they're in the light. But how will we be part of this joy? Like Israel, we were weak. But God, he is strong. And then Isaiah gives us three steps to see God's grand design. There will be three fours, F-O-R-S, in verses 4, 5, and 6. So let's start with the first four in verse 4. Are you all confused yet with all the fours? All right, verse 4. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Isaiah considers their joy to be like the joy of the victory of the Israel of Israel and Gideon over the people of Midian. This story of Gideon, Gideon and Midian comes from the book of Judges. In this story, the people of Israel decided to fo- do their own thing, to reject God. They did evil in the sight of God, so God gave them over to the Midianites. The Midianites They were uh, overpowerful, they were oppressive, and for seven years, they would come into the land of Israel at harvest time to steal all the crops. The book of Judges describes the the Midianites to be like locusts when they would naturally come at harvest time to, to devour the crops. These Midianites were bad dudes, and the Israel, and Israel was uh, helpless. They had no hope, and they were in distress. But Gideon was called by God to be the deliverer of over the Midianites and for the people of Israel. So Gideon was tasked to form an army. He, he, his army began at 32,000 soldiers, but God said that God was going to get the glory. Gideon wasn't going to get the glory. Israel wasn't going to get a, the glory. God was gonna, gonna, going to get the glory. So God reduced the number of soldiers from 32,000 to 300. Now, I imagine Gideon was a little anxious when there were 32,000 soldiers. Now he only has 300 soldiers. So the plan was for Gideon's army to to make a lot of noise with different jars and with trumpets. And when when they did this, they made all this noise. The Midianites went into a panic. And the Midianites ended up destroying and turning on each other. Israel, they were weak. They were powerless. They were outnumbered. But God, through Gideon, brought victory and brought peace over the Midianites. 
Because the power of God, the oppressive yoke, and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, was destroyed. And like Gideon, Jesus will be victorious. But Jesus' deliverance will be greater than Gideon's deliverance. Where Gideon's deliverance was just over one nation of Midian, God's deliverance will, and Jesus' deliverance will be over everything, every one, every evil oppressor, every evil nation. God will defeat all the evil forces of this world, and he will put an end to all, all conflict. Jesus will be, bring peace and be a greater deliverance than Gideon. Now let's look to, at the second four in verse five, where we see how he's going to do that. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. All tyranny and all conflict will end because of the power and the grace of God. Jesus' death and resurrection will defeat and have beaten Satan in what seemed to be uh, an unbeatable yoke of sin and death. But Jesus is victorious. Jesus is victorious where we were weak and we were lost. He is victorious. And if you're a follower in here of Jesus, you will be victorious with Jesus. You have a victor. And you get to celebrate with Jesus as if you won the battle yourself. Think about when your football team wins. You didn't play a single down, but you celebrate as if you did. That is what it will be like for us. Where we didn't do a thing, Jesus did. And we get to celebrate because of Jesus. That is our victor. We have victory because of Jesus. And our victor came near to us as a child. So let's look at the last four in verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This light and victor from the first five verses is finally being revealed to us in verse 6 as a child. He is a son given, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And to many... And the many of the Jews at this, uh, in the New Testament, the victor being a child would have been absurd. They believed the Messiah to be one to come as a warrior. He would be riding on a horse and defeating Rome and all the evil oppressors of the world. Which Jesus will do that, but not the way they wanted him to. God didn't defeat tyrants by just becoming a bigger tyrant. God defeated evil with Jesus. He defeated sin and death with Jesus. He defeated your sin and death by going to the cross, dying, bearing your sins, and then raising three days later. That is God's answer. And whoever believes in him will spend eternity with him. So we celebrate a child because what he will do in, at Easter time. And that's why we celebrate Jesus, uh, Christmas. We celebrate Christmas because we celebrate the birth of a Savior. We celebrate Jesus who died for our sins. Isaiah says the child given to us will bear the weight of a lasting and perfect government. W.A. Criswell was a pastor and seminary, process, seminary president, and he said this about Jesus. The shoulders that bear the government of the, of the universe are the shoulders that bore the cross to Calvary. This child that bears this weight of a perfect and lasting government is the same child that bears your sins on his shoulders. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. And then Isaiah gives us four names of Jesus. And we're going to begin with the first name given, which is Wonderful Counselor. The word wonderful refers to the ability to do the supernatural. The word counselor is to give good advice, to give wide advice, wise advice, like an advisor to a king. So Jesus, he has the best teachings. He has the best ideas. He has the best plans and the, the best strategies. And we can receive wisdom by going to him. Oftentimes we seek wisdom from things that aren't wonderful, that don't have great plans and aren't looking out for our good. So maybe consider what are you seeking wisdom from if it's not from God? Is it academia? Which going, Being in school is great and learning is great, but if you're only finding wisdom there, you're going to be on a different path. Maybe it's Instagram. I don't know how many people we should be finding wisdom from on Instagram, but there are good things that people can share. But if we're only finding our wisdom from there and not from God, then we're going to be on a dark path. 
Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. His wisdom is beyond our knowledge and comprehension. And to find and have wisdom is to find to be with the Lord. We must look to our wonderful counselor to have good wisdom. The second name given is Mighty God. Isaiah calls this child, he was given to us, Mighty God. And the word mighty is a word to describe powerful men. This would be a man who would lead other men into battle. The word mighty emphasizes great power. And this word God is the word most used in Hebrew for the divine. This is where, in, in calling Jesus mighty God, is where we get the affirmation of the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus came to us as a child. Jesus, this child, is God. This mighty God shows that Jesus has absolute and infinite power. Jesus will de defeat all the sin of the world and defeat all the enemies and death of the world, which for us as sinners is really good news, that we were helpless in darkness, but God saved us, that we have a mighty God. Christmas, for some of us, is filled with a lot of joy, a lot of friends, a lot of laughter. You're able to get the gifts your wife and children want. You, you're looking forward for this Christmas. But some of you, this year has been nothing like that. This has been a really tough year financially, maybe emotionally. Maybe this is the first Christmas without a loved one in your life. And so you're filled with a ton of grief and you're filled with a ton of sorrow. And I would tell you that those feelings are real. And it's okay to have those feelings, to feel sorrowful and to, have to, to grieve. But live as someone who has hope in a mighty God. In a mighty God who defeated all the enemies of the world. So if you're here and you have those feelings and you Look to a mighty God who has eternal hope. You can live as someone with hope. Now let's look to the third name, eternal father. The word eternal means forever, meaning God has no beginning. He's no end. God has always been. And then we see the word father, which it seems a little weird to attribute the word father to Jesus because Jesus came as the son. But what we see here is that we can learn that Jesus has a love like a good father. His love is never ending, like a good father's love will never end. Which is amazing to me that a sinner who rebelled against God, that his love never ends and it is always consistent and it never ceases, it never wavers. God doesn't regret loving us, he doesn't regret saving us, even when it feels like we're doing everything to make him forget us. God didn't save a future version of you, he saved you. Now, maybe you're in here and you feel dejected in your faith. You, you feel like, I haven't read the Bible in six months. I haven't prayed in seven months. And you feel that God can't love you. You're certain that God can't love you. But I would say to you that his love is eternal. It never ceases. And it, and it never wavers. And if this is you, I would say start today. Begin reading the Bible today. Start praying today. Read and pray through the Psalms. If you're a man in here, join a T214 group that starts in January where you and other men can read scripture together, can be an encourager to one another. If you're a woman, every fall and spring we have our women's Bible study where you can be with, another, with other women in the church to encourage each other in the scriptures. Maybe you're in here and you're actively living in sin and rebelling against God and you're just doing everything to rebel and turn away from him. But where have you moved? Jesus has not moved. His love never ceases. He is faithful even when we are not. And God is calling you to repent. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So where our sin separates, he doesn't move and he loves us forever. Now let's look at the final name, Prince of Peace. Prince is a common word for, the, for government officials in the Bible. And Jesus is described as being a, a, a ruler who will give peace. Peace is something that we're always searching for in the world. We, we, we watch the news and it's talking about how can we get peace in our country, in other countries. We're always looking for peace. But the reality is, apart from Jesus, we will never have peace. We'll never know, cheap, uh, know peace. And unless you know Jesus, you won't have peace. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troub troubled, neither let them be afraid. 
Jesus gives us a peace that no one or no thing can ever give. He also gives us the peace when we are in sorrow, when we are dealing with life. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Life is hard and it feels like you're taking all the punches of the world. Like, like I mentioned a second ago, this might be the hardest Christmas you've had in a while, but take peace. You have a Savior who has overcome the troubles of this world. And ultimately, we can have peace with God because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Where our sin separated us from God, in Jesus, we can have peace with God. So we've seen the four names of Jesus. One writer said it like this, This royal son's counsel is wise, his power is divine, his love is fatherly, and his rule creates peace. That is our God that came near to us. This God who came as a child to save us. And that is our, this is our victor, and his victory is certain. So let's look at our king, which takes us to our final point in verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This child that we're talking about is the eternal king, and his rule will never end. And there's no king or no kingdom that will ever stand against his rule. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Where we were lost and where we were weak, helpless sinners, Jesus came in his love and his righteousness so that we could be saved and his kingdom will reign forever. As promised to David in 2 Samuel, Jesus will reign on his throne and rule forever. His rule will continue to go, and it will continue to increase. And if you follow Jesus and live by faith, you will be saved and eternally live in his victory and in his kingdom. When Jesus came near to us, he came near to us as a child. He lived a perfect life, who taught on the kingdom that would come near, and his kingdom will never end. And it will never end because of what is said at the end of verse 7. Because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. God's zeal for his son's glory will make this happen. And nothing will stand against Jesus and his kingdom. So now what? We've, after going through these three, seven verses and these three points, what are we supposed to do with this? So God came near and he gave us a perfect gift. All gifts have a giver and all gifts have a receiver. The last thing you do to a gift after you wrap it is put a sticker on it that says to and from for it, from, uh, on it. This gift, this perfect gift is from God. This perfect gift is eternal life. It's a Savior, Jesus. And this gift is from God and to you. This is a gift that we don't have to work for. We don't have to buy. This gift is a free gift because he loves us. And if you receive and embrace this gift, you will have eternal life. Where my Xbox is collecting dust somewhere, Jesus will never collect dust. He will be eternal. And this gift is Jesus. Jesus who brought light into our darkness, victory to our defeat, and welcomed us into his kingdom. So my question for us this morning is, how will you respond to this gift from God? To this gift that is free, will you receive him and embrace it? Or will you reject this gift from God? If you're in here and you're not a Christian, we've been talking all morning about a, Christ, about a child who's come and will, is a king and will bring his kingdom. What will you do with this king? Will you reject his rule and follow other kings and continue to go down these dark paths? Or will you live in faith? Will you, will you embrace this gift that is given to us? The day is the day of salvation. Jesus lived a perfect life, death, and resurrection, and he's holding out this free gift of eternal life to you. To you. And if you're in here and you're a Christian, rejoice in Jesus who has won the victory. We don't have to live as people who live in defeat. Jesus has won the battle. He is our victor. Live in him. Consider the four names of Jesus. We have a mighty king who gives us wise counsel, who loves us forever and will give us peace. So if in, you're in here and you're, and you're struggling in your faith, remember you have a God who never moves. He, he will live and love you for eternity will give you peace take heart he has overcome the world and if you're in here and you're struggling look to this wise counselor mighty god everlasting father and prince of peace consider again what wa chriswell said 
the shoulders that bear the government of the universe are the shoulders that bore the cross to Calvary. So as you go purchase gifts, you wrap these gifts and you open gifts, remember we have a great and perfect gift that came to us and bore your sins on the cross. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this morning and this morning that we can gather here and hear your perfect gift. God, thank you for the perfect gift of Jesus that gives us eternal life and salvation. God, we love you. We thank you for the blessings you give us. We thank you for um, friends and family who can celebrate during this Christmas time, but we thank you most of all for Jesus. We love you and we praise you in his name. Amen.